I want to read to you Hebrews 11, verses 17 to 19 as we continue our series on the heroes of the faith. And by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said in Isaac, your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received them back as a type. So today we want to look at the test of faith. Abraham's final exam. The author of Hebrews tells us that it came when God asked Abraham to offer up Isaac, which took place in Genesis chapter 22. So what he talks about in Hebrews 11 actually took place in Genesis 22, this final exam. He is told to offer up Isaac, who was the promise. So here's when you know it's a major test because you're getting ready to have a major promotion to a whole nother level. You know it's a major test when it calls for something significant in your life and at the very same time makes absolutely no sense at all. It's a major exam when God is asking you to do something, to be something, to go somewhere, there is some demand being placed on you and it makes absolutely no sense at all. Hebrews 11 says that God told Abraham to offer up Isaac who was the son of the promise. In Genesis chapter 22, where the story is unfolded for us in that chapter in detail, God tells Abraham these words. He says to Abraham in Genesis chapter 22, Now it came about, verse 1, after these things, that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am, and he said, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain of which I will tell you. That made no sense. Well, let me show you why because it is full of contradictions. Theological contradiction, number one. I made a promise that through you, I'm going to birth a nation via your son Isaac, now kill him. But Isaac is a teenager, he's not married, he has no children. You told me through him, you're gonna build a whole nation and affect the whole world, how can he be the extension of the lineage that you promised if I kill it. It's a contradiction. When God is giving you a major exam, it makes no sense. It looks like God is contradicting himself. Not only was it a theological contradiction, it was a biblical contradiction because in Genesis chapter 9, God condemns murder. He says, you cannot take the life of another person. Yet he just told Abraham to take the life of his son. So God not only has contradicted his promise, he's contradicted his whole biblical teaching. God, right now, what you're asking doesn't make sense. Not only was it a biblical contradiction and a theological contradiction, it was an emotional contradiction. Because he says, take your son whom you love. Your only son, your only son through Sarah, and I want you to take him and sacrifice him. I love this boy. I've waited a hundred years for this boy. You're asking me to give up the thing I love most? Watch this. You're asking me to give up the very thing you bless me with. 
that's, that's a pull on the heart string that you can't explain. God, that doesn't make sense. Not only was it a theological contradiction, a biblical contradiction, an emotional contradiction, it was a relational contradiction. How are we going to explain this to Sarah, your, your baby mama? Because it ain't nothing but drama. How are we going to explain to Sarah, I'm getting ready to take our son out and slay him because that's what God told me. Now you know why it says Abraham got up early in the morning. He had to get up before Sarah got up so he wouldn't have to explain any of this. Worst of all, maybe, it was a spiritual contradiction. Because God tells him, take Isaac, slay him, and worship me. If there was ever a day you don't feel like going to church, this is the day. Because how do you worship God with a broken heart? But it says Abraham got up. There's another thing you need to observe. It says, get up and go to the mountain to the place I will show you. He had to obey without all the details. God didn't give him all the information. He says, after you get up and after you get to the mountain, then I'll show you the spot I want you to go to. But I'm not going to give you all the details up front. I will only give you more details when I see you moving. When he gets up, I want you to keep this verse in mind, verse 4. I'm just going to read it right now. Uh, we're going to pick it up in a minute. Verse 4 says, on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Let me read verse 4 again. Verse 4 says, on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Somebody say third day. Third. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Keep that on your frontal lobe. He tells the young men, the servants who help carry the load, Y'all stay here, and I and the lad will go up, and we will worship and return to you. Well, wait a minute now. Abe, God just told you to go kill him. Abe tells the boys, uh, I'm going up here to worship. You boys stay here, me and Isaac. We're going up here to worship, and when we finish our church service, me and the lad will come back. Well, wait a minute now. God just told you to kill him. Y'all stay here. I'm going up here. Take care of what God told me to do. And when I finish what God told me to do, me and the boy will see you afterwards. But God told you to kill him. So what you mean? We coming back to see you afterwards. See, when you're called to faith, you got to speak the truth in the midst of the contradiction of the circumstance. Hebrews 11 says the reason he said that was because he believed God was even able to raise the dead. That's what Hebrews 11 says. So if I obey you, God, and do what you told me to do, and at the same time believe your promise that you're going to work through Isaac to make a great nation, then I also have to believe, since you don't contradict yourself, that if I do what you tell me to do, you got some kind of miracle you're planning to bring me and this boy back here again. But what made him speak that? Where, where did this faith confidence come that God could raise the dead? Uh, well, you recall Sarah's womb was dead. And Abraham couldn't function no more at 100 years old. And God created a hookup. <laughs> and the miracle baby of Isaac was born. He had seen what God could do in raising a womb. So he figured the same God could raise a son. So when God calls you to a major exam, don't forget what he did in the quizzes. 
Don't forget what he did yesterday when he moves you to a bigger challenge tomorrow. Because if it's bigger today than what he did yesterday, it's because he's moving you to a new grade level, a higher experience with him. And so they make their way to the place that God said. So Abraham now is talking to Isaac. Isaac says to his father, my father, verse 7 of Genesis 22, here I am, my son. He said, uh, uh, behold, I see the fire, I see the wood, but I don't see the lamb. Every other time we went to church, we had a sacrifice. But today, you ain't bring a lamb. What's up, dad? Dad looks at his son, can't say anything. He, he can't say, hey, you the lamb. Because it's hard for a man over 100 years old to chase a teenager running away. Because I don't know about you, but I'd be up out of here, up out of here. Catch me, dad, if you can. Does my middle name look like lamb to you? Right? You know what he says? He says, son, God's got to fix this one. The Lord will provide himself because I don't have an answer for you. I don't know how this is going to work out. And when God puts you in a final exam, you don't know how this is going to work out. God has got to do something here because only God has an answer to this dilemma of faith that I'm in. Because this is a midterm or a final. This is not a, a little pop quiz and, and it's confusing. And I, I, God's got to provide the solution. And so he takes his son up. He puts him on the altar. Verse 9, he built an altar, arranged the wood, bound his son Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Can you imagine what he's thinking, feeling? And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, that's Jesus in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, Abraham, Abraham, whenever God calls your name twice. See, when he told him to obey, he only called his name once in verse 1, Abraham. But now in the middle of his crisis, he calls his name twice. That means there's something special coming down the pike. Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Do not, verse 12, stretch your hand out against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know you fear me since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. So what then is being said to Abraham at this moment? He is saying, Abraham, now I know you love me because I see it and feel it. In other words, you have now given me the experience of your love, not merely the verbalization of it. What is your Isaac? That thing that God can't have because you're too attached to it. And God says, bring it here. We're talking about the test of faith and we're not talking about a pop quiz now. We're talking about a final exam. Now I know. And there we have it. Watch this. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, verse 13, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. That's one of the great names of God in scripture, Jehovah Jireh. Whatever God is going to do in your life and circumstance, he has already pre-seen, but you won't see it provided 
until you have completed what he's asked you to do. Most Christians are part-time saints. They'll do a little something, something and wonder why God hadn't come through yet. But the question is, have you finished what he's asked you to do? God's prevision doesn't become his provision until obedience has been finalized. So if you take 50 years, it may take 50 years for you to see his provision. If you delay obedience, you delay prevision becoming provision. The Bible uses Abraham in James 2 when it talks about faith. And in James 2 when it talks about faith, it says, by faith Abraham was justified by works when he offered up Isaac and he was called a friend of God because he was willing to believe God against the backdrop of the ridiculous. If you've never seen God move against the backdrop of the ridiculous, of the final exams in life that makes no sense, where folks would call you a fool. But it was clear to you that this was what God said. Based on his word, spoken to you by the Holy Spirit, then you've not seen what faith can do. And if you only operate by sight, you'll never see what faith can do. Because you'll only see what you see, and if what you see is all you see, you do not see all there is to be seen. So what does God say? Oh, it gets sweet now. God says to him, Verse 15 of Genesis 22, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you, I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of the enemies in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. It says I swear. It says I swear. The Bible says by two immutable things it is impossible for God to lie. He couldn't lie if he wanted to. The two things are his promises and his oath, his swearing. God makes promises and then he swears. What's the difference? A promise is something God says he will do with no time table connected to it. A promise says what he will do, but a promise doesn't tell you when he will do it. It only tells you what he will do. And there are thousands of promises in the Bible. The promises, unless it specifically says otherwise, only tells you what he will do. It doesn't tell you when he'll do it. That's different than an oath. When he says, I swear, God had made this promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, and now he makes it again in Genesis 22. This isn't the first time he said that. He'd been promising this to Abraham since Genesis 12. And then Genesis 12, you know, he's like 75 years old. So this is over 25 years now that he's been hearing the same promise. Promise, 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 promise. Now he's over 100 years old. Isaac is a teenager. There's a promise, 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 promise. When is this promise going to happen? All he's had is a promise. He's not yet had an oath. But now, after he does this, pass the final exam. A promise becomes an oath. What's an oath? Oath is where God repeats a promise, but then now has attached a time to it. When God makes an oath, it means I'm ready to do it now, and you have nothing else to do but watch me do my thing. That's an oath. Oath is when you watch God do his thing because he's no longer looking to you to do anything. Why? Because you passed the final. See, once you pass the final exam, you don't have to do anything to get your next grade level. He says, Abraham, I got it now. I got it. 
because you've obeyed my voice in the final, in this tough thing I've asked you to do, I got it from here. I'm going to swear by it. The good news here is that Abraham has had failures in his past. He's blown it a few times over these 25 plus years. God just gave him retesting. Some of us are here today and we've been retesting and retesting and retesting and retesting and retesting. And retesting and retesting and retesting and retesting and God says, I'll wait till you pass. Because I want to give you an experience with me. You want the provision. I want the experience. Give me the experience of your commitment and I'll show you what I can do with rams caught in the thicket waiting to move when I tell it to. But that raises a question. On this journey of faith, you're struggling, you're walking by your, with your Isaac, you're holding Isaac's hand, you're holding that situation by the hand and God is telling you to kill it even though you love it and you just, you walk in, how do you make it? How do, you, how do I make it? I don't know when God's going to do it, I don't know how God's going to do it, I don't know, I don't know how am I going to make it? In fact, Jesus goes on to say, in the last few verses of John chapter 8, he says, watch this, Abraham saw my day and was glad. Genesis 22 verse 4. Abraham is on his way to Mount Moriah and he looks in the distance and he sees something. Jesus in the New Testament tells us what Abraham in the Old Testament saw. Jesus said, Abraham saw my day. What day did Abraham see? Let me tell you a little secret. Mount Moriah is located a few hundred yards from Mount Calvary. There are just a few hundred yards that separate Mount Moriah from the hill of Golgotha. Jesus said, Abraham saw my day and he smiled. So Abraham is walking to kill his son, looks up and goes, <laughs> yeah. He says, Abraham focused on me. And while he kept his eyes focused on me, that's why Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. It says, while you're on your journey, in your final exam, keep your eyes on Jesus. Because if you'll focus on Jesus, he'll get you up the mountain of your exam until you pass the test. Don't look at people, they'll discourage you. Don't look at circumstances, they'll flip the script. He says, keep your eyes on Jesus as you obey God, because when you keep your eyes on Jesus, he will sustain your faith until you reach the finish line of your test. When you're in doubt, look at Jesus. When you're afraid, look at Jesus. When you're unsure, look at Jesus. When you're tempted, look at Jesus. When you fail, look at Jesus. When you're frustrated, look at Jesus. When you don't think you can make it, look at Jesus. Keep looking at Jesus because if Abraham could look at him in the Old Testament and he hadn't even come yet, how much more should you and I look at him now that he's come, died, and arose, and it all happened on day number three? Well, I hope you're inspired and challenged to become a hero of the faith based on this hero of the faith by passing whatever test God has you taking right now. And to help you grow in your understanding of faith, we want to offer you volume one of Heroes of the Faith. This first volume will let you see a number of the folks we've been talking about and how God used their faith to bring them a new experience of his reality in their lives. So contact us here at The Urban Alternative, 1-800-800-3222 or log on to TonyEvans.org and get your volume one of Heroes of the Faith. And also remember that we survive, that we are able to sustain our ministry 
by your generous gifts. So would you support us so that we can keep supporting your growth in your faith? God bless you, and I'll be with you again, same time, same place, next week.